So here for this one on a Monday morning, we have the senior football writer, Ollie Cairn, as well as Merseyside football writer, Simon Hughes, who were both at Anfield yesterday. Ollie, let's start with you. Another enthralling match between Manchester City and Liverpool, as you've written about as well. Yeah, it was uh, it was brilliant. It was it was a joy to to be there, privileged to be there, privileged to write about. It was it just it just felt like one of those games where um, just so much happened and and so much quality and so much drama. Um, both teams. I mean, even at I mean, I, I don't think a, a draw is a bad result for either either team at all. But whereas in years gone by, in that kind of situation, you would often see two two teams easing off and just sort of settling for a draw, almost shaking hands on a draw in, in the last 10 minutes. There was absolutely none of that. I mean, you look at Doku hitting hitting the post at one end. You look at Diaz dribbling the length of the pitch, turning Walker inside out, inside out, inside out. Um, you look at the penalty appeal, a disallowed goal in stoppage time, was it? I, I, I don't know how far offside that was, whether it was a a blatant one, but it would so much happen just in stoppage time. And um, it was just, it, I, it was funny. I've been saying all season that I don't think these two teams are quite at the level of um, their sort of tussles for the title in, well, the, the level that the, the two teams were 28, 20, mm. 2018, 19, 20 ish in Liverpool's case. Um, but, that was a really, really high quality game. I don't think it was as high as quite as high as that that two one win for City at the Etihad in January twenty nineteen. But it was it was definitely a real classic, a Premier League classic. Uh, had everything, had the quality, and it was played in a really good spirit. And it, it could sound a bit sort of trite and a bit soft to say that when we're meant to look for antagonism and war and drama of that type <laughs> but it was i mean it was a credit to both managers and teams there was there was barely a there was barely a bad tackle there was barely a there was barely a um a sort of a handbag in sight yeah, to, to be fair, you could see the warmth that right at the end, Jurgen Klopp and, and Pep Guardiola hugging, having a little chat in each other's ear. Uh, Simon, I was at Anfield on Friday working and we were talking about the emotion that surrounded this game. You know, it's the last time Pep's going to be facing Klopp, you know, and, and you know, the Anfield faithful are going to be singing their hearts out. Um, you were there with the fans. What were your thoughts on that match? First of all, I'm just really surprised to hear that Ollie's looking for some sort of Corinthian spirit. <laughs> Very unlike him. Um, you, you underestimate me. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> yeah, um, it, was, it was an incredible game, and I, Ollie, Ollie touched on it then that that, that game in in 2018, 19. Mm. I, I thought that was the best game, one of the best game I've ever seen in the Premier League. Even, even being honest, I'm sure fans of Man United and Arsenal will, will point to other games, but. Liverpool lost that game and it, it, it could have, either team could have won it. Um, I think the reason why that this game maybe wasn't quite at that level was was because of the absentees, you know, that the, the mm. were obviously both teams were had, had a few problems around uh, players that were unavailable for Liverpool and then players that got injured for City as well as the game went on and players not quite being at their level. So Kevin De Bruyne obviously didn't, didn't I would say, perform at his very best. But, um, I think when these two teams have met over a long period of time, particularly in the second half of the season, what is great about it is you never see one of them thinking, "Oh, we'll we'll sort of see how this goes and mm. and just just take our chances in the set the, you know the last twenty minutes of the game if the opportunity presents itself. When Liverpool and City have met over a long period of time, um, and there's something at risk, they both go for it, which. You know, it sort of reminded me of a really, this is going to sound a bit weird, but a really great Sunday league game where there was no filter almost. It was just like, right, we're both going to go at this. And by the end, you could tell how tired the players were. They were exhausted. And that made it even better because because they were a bit tired. It was allowing chances to, to form on the pitch. Um, you, you could have pointed towards maybe 10 man of the match candidates, I think, because... Ollie mentioned it there, Diaz turning and Kyle Walker inside out. That wasn't because Kyle Walker was playing badly. It was just because Diaz was having a right old go at him. And then and other points in the game, obviously, there were other players doing the same to other players. I, I just thought it was it was just brilliant, brilliant to watch. Um, 
But I don't think it puts us any closer to really knowing who's going to yeah. win the league. I think that's that's the great part of it, really. I think um, certainly, um, you know, there's still 10 games to go, which is a quarter of the season. People forget, don't they? It's still mm. a long time to go. And I, I even think I've had the been a winner yesterday. Um, I don't think necessarily that would have borne out that the team that had won would have won the league. But I actually think that Liverpool would have came out of the game yesterday a little bit more confident than City because of A, the number of players they had missing and B, the way they played the second half, really. I think, I, I thought, you know, they were, they were, they were brilliant, Liverpool. Yeah, Oli, I'm just thinking, like, how, how much are we going to miss this, this rivalry? But not just that. Is this better than the Ferguson Wenger rivalry when it comes to match quality as well? I would say, in terms of the quality, um, yes, it is better. And the, and the, the excitement levels within the game, the, the, the openness of the games. I know, a lot of probably Arsenal fans and Manchester United fans will say no, no, no. The quality was much higher with with mm. you know, Thierry Henry and you know Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, Ryan Giggs, etc. I mean, it, look, let's be honest. That was an incredibly high standard in the Premier League at that, that time. But I think the Premier League has improved enormously over over two decades in terms of in terms of the fact that we now have. A huge proportion of the world's best players playing in in the Premier League. That wasn't mm. the case in the nineties. It wasn't. It became more that way in the two thousands, and uh, gradually more and more. But you know, it, we have a mon monopoly, not monopoly, but we have a the, the Premier League has dominates the market in terms of the best coaches, the best players. Um, and I'm not saying that in a rah rah rah. The pre you know the Premier League is wonderful kind of way because I don't think it's healthy for world football for. Mm. One league to be so dominant, but it's a roundabout way of saying I think the league, the quality of the league is higher now. So if we're looking at the two best teams and the two best teams frequently, or three best teams maybe with Arsenal emerging, but those two teams, Liverpool and City, have frequently cleared ninety put ninety odd points mm. in this era, which those two teams didn't in what I think was not such a high standard technical standard Premier League. Um, then, yeah, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying yes. I think this league is is a higher standard than than then, and the, 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 this rivalry is a is is of a higher technical standard. You don't get the same drama and antagonism and theatre off the pitch. You don't get Roy Keane clashing with Patrick Vieira and saying mm. we'll see we'll see you out there in, in a tunnel. You don't get Ferguson and Wenger throwing insults or Ches Fabregas throwing pizzas, but you do get. Um, you do get really, really high quality football. Um, it feels like, um, given the given the demand for sort of Netflix style Netflix style sort of Premier League soap opera entertainment, it feels like that kind of crazy rivalry of United Arsenal would probably fit better, more easily into the modern age of of you know where the football is almost like a, a sideshow. But this is what we've got, and it, it's been it's been brilliant the last few years. And whoever takes over from Klopp will have a huge, um, well, huge footsteps to follow in, in in terms of the job at Liverpool, but also the job in terms of elevating the Premier League the way the way that that Klopp has. Yeah, and Oli, I'm sorry, Simon. Um, you know, you talk about this feeling like a a Sunday League tie. You know, both te teams going hammer and tongs. Do you think Liverpool would be kicking themselves a bit? I don't know. I watching that match. I mean, there were almost a hat-trick of chances, at least for Diaz alone, that you feel he could have buried as well. Do you think they might leave there thinking, actually, we might have been able to get three points out of this match, considering the, the cacophony of the, the Anfield crowd as well? There, there will be regrets, definitely, because the chance was there to win the game. Um, but knowing the way sort of the, the manager thinks and operates in the aftermath of this, he will turn that, I suspect, into some sort of positive where... It will be a driver to go better again. Because it's not like the opportunity has set them back completely by not taking it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still level on points with Arsenal. Um, as I say, with 10 games to go. So I think, I mean, looking at his quotes afterwards, Ollie, Ollie was listening to him in the press room. Mm -hmm. He came away quite satisfied with the, the level of performance, certainly. Well, not more, more than satisfied. He said it was the, the best performance against City. I think 
there's a bit of context with that. I think that obviously it's the the number of players Liverpool had missing, which I think again, I think he's using that at the moment, you know, as a as a driver, you know, like creating that sort of underdog siege spirit, which I also think dovetails perfectly well with you know the Liverpool fan base who like to sort to present themselves as the underdog. There's that underdog feeling, which it might not bear any reality, but if if it's there and it feels that way, it's it's very difficult to stop. So, I mean, to to get to get through the the matches that Liverpool have got through with the number of players that they've had missing and be in this position where they're they're still fighting on all fronts is incredible. I came on here saying a few weeks ago, you know that. Um, if you were to certainly win the Premier League from this position, I think it would be an incredible achievement given, you know, Arsenal couldn't win it last year when they had a couple of players injured. Liverpool two weeks ago had 12 players missing, you know. So all this, I think, is is being manipulated by by the manager in a, in a very clever way. Um, I'd just like to answer a little bit on, on what Ollie, Ollie just said there about the, mm. you know, the, the, the standards. I, I think that the one big thing that has changed, there's obviously the pace... It's just getting quicker and quicker and quicker. The, the pace at which Liverpool and City do things, the top teams, is just getting faster all the time. I, I saw a game between City and Man United from the 2010 period on TV a couple of weeks ago, and it was just noticeable how... I'm not saying that the game was slow, but it was just slower than it is now. I think now that the the defences of both teams are almost the creators, you know, of and play an active role in the in the attacking elements of the game. That's been a big change. You know, if you if you look back at the sort of Wenger Wenger Ferguson periods, obviously players like Sol Campbell, uh players like Yap Stam could play football, but the primary role was to defend, whereas now the defense's role is to attack. And I think that's what has helped create this sort of sense that the the, the quality is higher. When the two teams meet, basically, and you just notice in those tight little areas, both teams are so good. You know, so many little pockets of play yesterday where you'd see Bernardo Silva work his way out of a really difficult position while under pressure. Same with Liverpool. I thought Alexis McAllister's performance was really good. Just tight little areas. So this is where I think the the game has has got better, which means that the quality is just the quality of the football is better. I'm not saying that all the time that. You know, the, the, the play is neat because, you know, the, there's a fair amount of speculation in the way that Jürgen Klopp plays, I would say, particularly. Um, and he embraces that. That's part of the that's part of the design. It's not like, you know, it's not like if, if a misplaced pass, if, if it's wayward, he's going to criticise it. He likes sort of, sort of go and direct when the opportunity is there, which I would say is streetwise in the way sort of football should be played, in my view. Yeah, Oli, you've written about this as well in terms of what this match in particular means for the title race. You know, Opta still have Arsenal at 19% to win the title and Liverpool 35% and Manchester City, who are now third, 46%. Pole position for Arsenal for this week at least. I think those percentages underestimate Arsenal. I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether it's based on some results over the last 12 months and therefore they take into account Arsenal's very poor running last season and, and Liverpool's good running and City's excellent running. I think if there were if it was a model based over across the two seasons or or well or just across this season, I think Arsenal would be very um I think Arsenal would be very well placed. Um they are I I think Arsenal fans would have come away from that game feeling more bullish about the title race because I think they probably feared I think they probably thought a draw was an excellent result for them beforehand. I think they probably would have felt that Man City winning that match would have would have been a bit ominous. And I think they would probably have felt Liverpool winning the match would have been ominous in a, in a different way. Um, I think Liverpool, I was you know, speaking to people beforehand, Liverpool fans said, who were saying that they would have happily taken the draw when they saw the team sheets and no Gennate, Robertson, uh, Salah, in the starting lineup, um, in addition to all the other absentees, Alison, uh, Matip, Jones, Gavin Birch, etc., Jota. Um, so it was, I I felt it was a good, a very good result for them, for them. I also think it was a really sort of uplifting, heartening performance from a Liverpool point of view. And I guess from a Man City point of view, you can say, well, to get through that, 
to, to be able to weather that storm in the second half was um was you know uh, might have felt like a victory g- given the way the second half unfolded but i i felt like city i i felt all along this season that city will win the league um yesterday did not enhance that feeling it, it props it, it made me question it slightly more and it was a good result you know a draw at anfield is is never a bad result but mm-hmm. it's just the fact that from position of total control in the early stages against a really depleted Liverpool, they lost control. Mm. And Liverpool, you know, for them to have done that, they had to fall off their level a bit. Liverpool had to perform at a level that was unexpected given the team that they had. And I think Arsenal and Liverpool will be looking, thinking, well, this isn't the Man City of one season ago. It's not the Man City mm. of 2019 or 2018. They might drop a few more points here and there, um, and I think I think they will actually, and I think Liverpool and Arsenal will as well. I think it's I think it's going to be that type of title race, which we've not really seen before for a long time, where where there are twists and turns in in the running. Um, so I I I would still put City as favourites, but I noticed that when you listed those um, probabilities, that City had fallen below fifty percent, mm. which is probably probably for the first time all season I don't know but it's it it feels to me like yeah that that sounds about right I, I would still have City as favourites but not mm. at 50% and I would probably bump Arsenal's numbers up a bit if if, yeah. if, if I was doing a more subjective um, uh, analysis but then again Arsenal have, have that really tough run of games coming up and they have just played they've had a brilliant run but mm. they've just played a load of teams who have been in poor form mm. Mm. every team who's towards the bottom of that form table Arsenal have just played played them and admittedly have played very, very well against most of them, but they are going to have much tougher tests ahead, not least at the Etihad. Yeah, Simon, do you, do you buy that? Do you see a dent in the armour of Manchester City this season? Yeah, I do. I, I, I thought at the start of the season, when you lose the players that they lost, the experience that they had, you know, Gundogan... Mares as well. He was always capable of scoring important goals in big games. Mm. I thought it is going to cost them at some point. I know they've replaced those players with with very talented replacements. You know, Doku on another day yesterday could have been the match winner. Uh, Kovacic, I think, is a fantastic player, but he hasn't quite, you know, performed for Man City to the levels that maybe people might have expected. I just think little little things like that can have a big bearing, you know, on on mm. on on what happens, particularly at this point of the season. So, as it's not the same city that is finishing the, this season that finished last season. I think that's quite important to remember. That being said, as I say, it's still ten games to go. So, if City, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that City win the next two or three games on the bounce, and then they're just in that rhythm then and then that what you know they're suddenly getting away from you um i think liverpool have got two games where it, it's going to be a test of emotions as well you know that liverpool have got to play uh, everton away um and manchester united away and the record at old trafford's over the last couple of seasons has been has been pretty good but it hasn't been you know they, they have shown over a longer period of time under clock that you know, that United on occasion have been able to to stop them winning at the very least. Uh, and then Arsenal, I mean, I, I just think that Arsenal, you compare last season to this season, they've signed better players. I think Declan Rice is an unbelievable player and has proven his worth over the last couple of weeks with his performances and some goals. My only question with Arsenal, I still think, is at the, the top and bottom end of the pitch, when it really matters and the pressure is on, do they have the number nine that might just get them that goal or the goalkeeper that's going to make them that save? You know, against Brentford was maybe a little bit of a reflection. I know Ramsdale comes into the game, the game having not played. He obviously has a role in the Brentford goal and then Arsenal have to be really patient in, in terms of getting over the line right at the end. But that's where they just fall away a little bit for me. That I'm still not absolutely convinced. I remember when Liverpool, for Liverpool to win the league, 
they had to go out and sign one of the best goalkeepers in the world. Mm. I'm not sure whether Arsenal have done that and the positions that they really need to to get to that position. I'm not saying that they won't because they could, but I'm still just, that's where the doubt is for me with Arsenal. Okay, well, let's move on to how Liverpool prepare for life after Jurgen Klopp. And then, Simon, I want to come to you on this one to start with because, um, you know, I've been to Anfield twice this season <clears throat> and spoken to Liverpool fans. And one of the things they love about Klopp's tenure is the fact that he's been able to bring the fans, the club and the city together. And that's such a a beautiful thing. Um in, in Ollie's words, quite a warm and beautiful thing, isn't it? Um, how has he managed to do that? Because it's not an easy feat. No. I, th I think one thing that really gets overlooked is the is the relationship, first and foremost, with the players and the author authenticity of his voice. So the players believe what he tells them. Mm. That then translates onto the pitch. And then that then is fed from the crowd on a match day and above everything else, you know, Liverpool fans, I know they, they, they love Klopp, but they want to see aggressive football that wins football matches and represents, you know, the, the people of Liverpool as well. You know, the, the locality is still important in Liverpool and it's still highly influential in terms of the way fans think. So the style of football that he's delivered, which is aggressive you know, the sort of never say die attitudes, mm. trying to come up with solutions to problems. I with with Klopp, you never sense that he ever thinks that any game is lost because of the team that he's putting out. Mm. Even if it's a weakened team, you always sense there's a chance they might win here because of the, the attitude that he's got. It's like you can win. And I think that sort of attitude is the, the attitude that people in Liverpool like to see. But you know, I think that that is the, the root cause of it, really. You know, the relationship with the players and people can see that because it manifests itself on the pitch. Um, and then from there, that spreads. You know, I think the the important... The Liverpool manager's voice is, is very important to people in Liverpool because it's not... OK, obviously, yes, half of the city or a, a big portion of the city su supports Everton. Mm. But certainly Liverpool fans in this city expect the manager to... It's almost like a civic role. It's it's not it's not just speaking for the football club. You are speaking on behalf of the people from the city who support Liverpool. So when he has spoken publicly publicly about big issues or issues out of football, you know he's he's either well he's he's very well informed and he's very well advised, but he's also coming from a place of um, a place of honesty in terms of what he thinks as well. So. All those things combined, I think, have have contributed towards this feeling around the club while he's been there. And even, even in the difficult spells, and have been difficult spells under him, you know, two out of the last three seasons have not been great. They haven't been great. You know, they've been, you know, quite poor, really. But there's never been a sense of people losing faith with Klopp, which in modern football, that's quite incredible, really. You know, like even no matter what you've achieved, if... You've had a bad season, by and large, never mind two. You know, there, there are people looking to get you out, but that just has not happened at Liverpool. And it never would, I think. I think people are also very loyal towards somebody who's done well by them. Maybe sometimes to the detriment to, to some extent, you know, I think mm -hmm. so that, that sort of happened under Benitez a little bit where it sort of, his achievements sort of maybe kidded some people into thinking that, you know, he deserves 100, you know, 100%. Um, support, but I think obviously Klopp's achievements are, are much greater than any manager since since um, over the last thirty years, and that is just such a powerful thing. You know, I think it's very very difficult to um, say if you're trying to report on the club and try and tell certain different sides of the story that might present a different light on Klopp. I think people find it hard to see past their absolute love for the man. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, Oli, this synergy between um, the team and the supporters, you know, um, Guardiola 
spoke about it post match you know <laughs> you you know sooner or later with this stadium you have 15 or 20 minutes where liverpool look like a tsunami coming for everybody who has the ball you know football fans will know dark arts have happened at anfield over the last few years getting results and grinding out results like no other um he's really turned that place into as as Simon would say, almost like a siege mentality within the fans. You know, they're behind their team. Yeah, I think I think people can find it quite grating to hear about the Anfield factor, the great European nights and all of that sort of mythology that surrounds Anfield. I think, you know, if you're a Crystal Palace fan who, or a Nottingham Forest fan who turns up on a average Saturday afternoon in the Premier League and, it, and the, the atmosphere is quite dull, you think, you know, God, will people stop going on about the Anfield atmosphere? Because it can be, it can be like anyway, it can, it can be flat at times. Mm. Um, but on the big occasions, um, I'd say, well, always on the big occasions. In you know, in the time I've been reporting on on football and and going to football, um, I remember being at, at, reporting on the Champions League, no, U, UEFA Cup semi final in two thousand and one when mm. Guardiola was in. Barcelona team and I'm sure he must go back to that in his mind because that was another of those nights when it, it, it just it just it feels almost feral and I don't I don't think any Liverpool fan would, would take offense at that, that adjective, adjective it just feels feverish and frenzied and um it's absolutely wild and it wasn't like that the whole game yesterday but there were mm. just periods where the atmosphere was cranked up and and the atmosphere on the pitch was cranked up and you hear Guardiola talking about it and how it just felt like a, I mean, he used the word tsunami about how it felt like, like it was just sort of cascading over them, the, 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 the play and the atmosphere. And, that, and that, that is how it looked. And it's, it's, it's a rare thing. Uh, and I'm sure, look, Klopp has definitely embraced that enormously. And the, the fans mm -hmm. have in, embraced it enormously with, with the football that Klopp plays, which is, massively suited to it but that atmosphere even existed when you know Gerard Houllier and Rafa Benitez were playing really kind of quite dour football at times and the fans would fans would turn it into this this sort of absolutely frenzied atmosphere where every every sort of throw winning a throw in felt like you know winning a corner in, in the mm. last minute of stoppage time so it's it's that's something that's you know that's that's part of Anfield's identity, Liverpool fan base's identity. It's part of Klopp's identity. It's worked really, really well there. And I do think it's, you know, when you look at Liverpool's record, there was one game against Leeds that they would lost at home last season. Jesse, Jesse Marsh, Jesse, the last Jesse manager. Marsh's Leeds, mm -hmm. yeah. and that is the only game they've lost in front of a crowd. Premier League game they've lost in front of a crowd at Anfield since. 2017, which was in Sam Allardyce, Sam Allardyce's mm. Crystal Palace. Mm. Virgil van Dijk, I don't think, has ever lost a Premier League game playing for Liverpool at Anfield. Mm. It's, it's every time they need, I mean, look, it's not always the Anfield factor. It quite often mm. can just come down to having better players than Bournemouth or Palace mm. or, or whoever. But in those games where the Anfield factor has need, needed to be a factor, it really has. And it's often turned defeats into draws and turn draws into wins. And um, yeah, I think Guardiola will be, um, I, I, I get the impression Guardiola has nightmares about the place because the only time he's ever won there was was in, in an empty Anfield during that COVID season. I think that, you know, that, that was a run of, was it six consecutive home defeats? Yeah. In, in front of low fans. Everton won there, Burnley won there. Mm, mm. Uh, in that at that point, um, it's Everton's. That's only Everton's only win at Anfield this century. Again, no fans. So mm. it's yeah. You, you can't on one high on one hand say that the the, the Anfield factor is overstated and then um, ignore the the stats, which really are remarkable. Okay, fantastic. Well, let's move on. So, you know, as Liverpool prepare to begin life after Jurgen Klopp, let's hear from David Ornstein with the latest on how the Reds are looking to remodel their off-pitch infrastructure with the return looking possible for former sporting director Michael Edwards. As we reported, I think on the 30th of January on The Athletic, in a phone call between Mike Gordon, the FSG president, and Michael Edwards, 
Edwards politely declined the opportunity to either return to Liverpool in a senior role or take a position within Fenway Sports Group themselves. The thing is that Fenway Sports Group didn't give up. They persisted. And at the end of February, they managed to hold some face-to-face talks with him in Boston while he was over there for a conference with Ian Graham. Now, Edwards has made clear that he never wants to return to being a sporting director. He would like to be higher up the tree in a more broad and overarching position at an organisation, whether it be a club or a different institution, that would involve him empowering a sporting director and people on the ground. And it seems that this is the kind of proposal that FSG have made to him. And I revealed on The Athletic on Friday evening that actually an agreement was now close for Edwards to take a senior position at FSG, which would include oversight of Liverpool's football operations. Now, the situation is not done, or was not at the time of reporting. Let's see how things develop. But the talks were advancing and progressing. So it's not so much Edwards going back to Liverpool as Edwards taking a new role. And many people will say, what did FSG do to convince him? Was it power? Was it responsibility? Was it money? We'll have to wait and see how it shakes up. But it certainly wasn't power because that was being offered by FSG in late February when he turned it down. It was being offered by Chelsea when they tried to get him to take a role under the new ownership and a number of other clubs and organisations who have come for him since leaving Liverpool in 2022. So it's a really busy time at Anfield, on and off the pitch, and they'll need and want, obviously, to get this right, to continue the competitiveness and success that we've seen in the Jurgen Klopp era and make sure that it continues into the future and that their sustainable model uh, continues to thrive. And that is not an easy task, but they'll do their absolute best to get it right. And they'll hope that Edwards is very much prominent within that if they can finalise a deal for him to take the role that I've explained. Simon, just how big is it? for Liverpool to bring back Michael Edwards? Well, it represents potentially a a big shift around the organisation of the club. I think what is left unexplained at the moment is what this means for FSG and how how they run the club. Because for a long period of time now, 10, 12 years, Mike Gordon, who's the, the president of FSG and is based in in a, in Boston has has basically been sort of the the sounding board if you mm-hmm. if you like for 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 the key personnel in in the most senior roles at the club and has acted as the bridge between certain departments. From the information that we've been told, Michael Edwards would be that sort of figure. It it, it seems so. That would represent a big change. I mean, we we've been we've reported a few times over the last couple of months that FSG are looking to cede more decision making mm. powers to people in Merseyside, and this would seem to be a part of that strategy. Um, obviously, the club haven't had a sporting director for a permanent one at least. Um. For quite some time now, really, they, obviously they, they knew that Julian Ward was leaving eighteen months ago. He left uh, coming up to ten months ago. They've had a temporary sporting director who was essentially Jurgen Klopp's man, tied in the club over the summer. So Richard Hughes is part of this conversation now, whose relationship with Michael Edwards goes back to um, the period when when Richard Hughes was a footballer at Portsmouth, and Michael Edwards was just entering the game as as a as a data analyst, um, and you know they, they they've done business together over over quite a long period of time uh, in their roles at Liverpool and Bournemouth. So, yeah, it's 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 a big you know it's 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 going to be a big moment when Jurgen Klopp leaves anyway because of you know the the personality he has and the power that he has. 
Mm. I think it's a good sign that, that it seems that Liverpool are getting closer to figuring out exactly what they're going to do and exactly what the future is going to look like. It feels that it, it seems like that the, you know, that the, the operation over the last sort of two years has become much more manager led than than it than they would have possibly have liked. Um, that's partly that's it's understandable really when you've got a manager mm. who's who's been as successful as Jurgen Klopp. Um, but by having Michael Edwards, by having a sporting director, possibly one or two other people coming in from from a variety of other places, that would seek to readdress that balance. And Edwards, um, Richard Hughes would become part of the decision making process around the new manager, which would reset that balance. Okay, um, and the whole Richard Hughes connection as well. Um former technical director at Bournemouth. There's a previous relationship here with, with Edwards, isn't there? It, should that be looked into as to why Edwards is also thinking of coming back as well to Liverpool? I think it's, I mean, the impression I get is that, is that it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it was a case of getting Edwards first and that Hughes was, would be part of that. But I, I, might, I might not be, um, I might not be correct in that, in that understanding. There's been a lot of, um, let's say, Spoke of mirrors with this with this appointment. I think I think if it, yeah they, they do they do go back a long time. Um, uh, Michael Edwards and Richard Hughes, and I'm sure that you know that that increases the the trust and understanding mm. between them. But Richard Hughes, as I mean, although he's an ex player, um, it's been sort of quite under the radar as a as a technical director. Um, he's very much being hired. On the basis of his work as a technical director, rather than on the basis of his his name as a player, um, his his record at Bournemouth, I think, is pretty good. I remember, you know, part of the pe- part of the reason why Michael Edwards got this um, reputation as a bit of a genius in the transfer market was um, was the, the the players he sold to Bournemouth and the fees he got for them, which was um, Dominic Solanke, Jordan Ibe, and and Brad Smith. Now, mm. Jordan Ibe just didn't work out at all at Bournemouth um, or anywhere since. He's had a lot of um, issues off the pitch. Um, but, you know, Brad Smith was a very small amount. Um, but Dom, Dominic Solanke, they were always adamant that was, you know, Eddie Howe, Richard Hughes, Bournemouth, Solanke himself, they were always adamant that was a that was a sort of one for the long term. And it's yeah. really worked out in the long term. He, whatever, whatever it is now, four years later, he really looks like a top Premier League sets forward. So if that if that was one of the great sticks to beat him with, and and he's come good. You look at Nathan Ake, Aaron Ramsdale, Tyrone Mings. This is a club that's yeah. But Bournemouth's recruitment, to my mind, has been really, really good over over that period. You know, and, and over more recent years, it's involved looking abroad and uh, into different markets, and they've done well getting players out of Italy and and Spain and. Holland, Belgium. You look at people like uh, Jefferson Lerma, they picked up for next to nothing. Mm. Juma picked up for next to nothing, and who've all done really well there, and then gone on to, um, gone on elsewhere. So he, he clearly knows what he's doing. Um, even if, um, even if yes, there is a there is a long association with um, with Michael Edwards, and what people a lot of people say about him is he's really sharp, he's really intelligent, mm. knows knows football, knows sort of European football inside out. And I think that's I think that's the kind of figure Liverpool need because of that the, I think there's been a real gap um I'd say the last twelve months uh in particular it's 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 felt like you know there's been a bit of a vacuum between Klopp and the ownership. I'm sure Klopp has felt that and I'm sure the people in the rec- recruitment department have felt that. So it's not just a case of getting the management appointment right that I think they had they have had to restructure and um and appoint and it's not just been a case of getting one silver bullet appointment which mm. is the sporting director or one silver bullet appointment which is the manager. They've got to get an awful lot of things right this summer and um I think it's probably reassuring to Liverpool fans that there is a an appointment or two imminent there. Yeah. Um very quickly um Edwards is 
potentially coming in as Jurgen Klopp is leaving the club side. Um, should we read too much into that? Um, well, I mean, around the time Michael Edwards left, um, <laughs> there was a, a lot of PR around sort of how, you know, it was his time to go and he'd done, you know, longer than a decade at the club and it was just the right time. But the reality was that there was, you know, I, I've been told by a number of sources that there was mm. tension between the two of them. And there's also that caveat that uh, when you've had a long-standing working relationship mm. in a high-pressured environment, that tends to happen b- between two people who have very clear idea of what they want. So, you know, Jürgen Klopp becomes the premier first manager to li- deliver Premier League title in Liverpool's history, or in Liverpool's, uh, in 30 years of Liverpool's history, suddenly he's getting a few more decisions and sort of the balance of power is is moving a bit. And Mm -hmm. Edwards, I believe, felt that, right, so I've done everything that I can achieve here. It's probably a good time to leave anyway. You know, if if, if the man, if if the sort of the, the, the system that we had and the balance between Edwards, Gordon and Klopp is now being destabilised to some extent, maybe it is a good time to to step away. So, um, I mean, <laughs> the weekend, Jürgen Klopp, or sorry, a couple of days after Jürgen Klopp announces his intention to leave the club, the story becomes public that Liverpool have mm-hmm. suddenly approached Michael Edwards. Uh, that was obviously, bro- that was broken by the Athletic. Um, obviously a well-sourced story. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that mm-hmm. you know that, that that has happened. And Michael Edwards wasn't wasn't keen on coming back straight away with with the with the the sort of the mm-hmm. the idea that Liverpool had. And Liverpool had to adapt that plan um, to some extent. It wasn't necessarily about about sort of more power as a sporting director. Mm-hmm. It was it was creating a different role and responsibility profile for him really. I mean I, I would have liked to have seen him come as a back as a sporting director to be honest mm. because you know there's a, a debate like who who is more inf- influential between Klopp and, and Edwards and it would have been interesting to see Edwards test himself in an environment without you know one of the world's great football managers. I guess he, he's still quite a young man. But it sounds like he, he doesn't want that sort of hassle. Um and at this moment in time, that that a more, I think that the term that's been used is a more overarching role, hmm. is something that appeals to him. Okay, well let let's move on before we wrap up because uh, you know, Klopp leaves. There's going to be a new manager that's going to be needed at at, at Liverpool. Um, how does the expected appointment of both Edwards and Hughes uh, affect how they search for a new manager, Ollie? I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm fascinated um, to see how it how it pans out. I, I'd love to be able to sit here and say this is what's going to happen, but I think if mm. if I was going to drop that bombshell, I, I think we would have written about it as a as a news story by now. I think I think it may be hints at something more outside the box, possibly. Mm. I think it, you know, maybe may more data driven, maybe more sort of intellect driven than the perhaps the more kind of impulsive assumption that that surrounded Jabby Alonso. I'm not saying Jabby Alonso would have been an impulsive appointment, but but it, I think that's one of I think that's what basically everyone everyone just assumed when, when Klopp announced his decision. I think everyone just assumed well Liverpool will go for Alonso and Liverpool will make him their top target and they'll They'll get that done. Um, maybe they will, but to me, it, it, it may be. I mean, we we hope to find out more and more about this uh, mm-hmm. over the coming days. But it, to me, it it makes that sound less of a fate accompli rather than more, perhaps, because mm-hmm. I, I just think there will be new ideas. It won't just be an ownership group thinking, "Oh God, what do we do here?" Everyone's saying. We go for Jabi Alonso. Let's do that, which is kind of what happened with with the club appointment. You know, there wasn't there, there wasn't it wasn't particularly a, a great 
detailed technical appointment or process it, it was it was largely a case of yeah this is what we feel this is this is what we'll go with so i think with in the case of um alonso it might be the decision they they arrive at anyway but if it had been an only if it had been with this gap in terms of intellect and power within mm-hmm. within the club the, the the structure of the club um i think maybe they would have just gone with what everybody was expecting them to do and i think maybe in this instance maybe we'll see them explore some more or less less fancy less expected options I, ruben Ab- amarim at um, sporting lisbon has been talked about whispered about a lot and um, i could see him certainly being in the picture but it might it might still um, end up with with lonzo though we will we shall see yeah also simon you know from a sporting director perspective you're still thinking there's a, a fair few contracts that need to be sewn up right <laughs> van dyke trent of course mohammed salah we we reported that you know that the saudis did come for mohammed salah in the, in the summer um there's a lot riding on what happens next at liverpool i, I would say after the managerial appointments that the uh, the player contracts that need renewing is, is the second in the intro, really, because, um, I mean, first things first, I mean, they can't afford to lose Trent Alexander-Arnold. He he has to be, in my view, in terms of his age and everything else, he's he's the player that they need to be really making sure that that's secured. It's, it's absolutely incredible that Liverpool, it's, it's getting to a year out and, you know, Liverpool have left it this late, really, regardless of, you know, well, you know, the temporary sporting director, who's dealing with it all, I, I, I just think very risky. Um, you know, I would, I mean, that's not to to, to denounce uh, the importance of Virgil van Dijk or Mohamed Salah, but I think if Liverpool were to lose a local player who has still got his best years ahead of him, you know, that hasn't happened since Steve McManaman. Um, I would be absolutely... Very surprised if other clubs have not been checking out what his status is. And it, it gives, by delaying it as long as it has, it gives other clubs the chance to convince the players that that, that um of their worth financially and, and, and tempt them with, with, with more money elsewhere, I would say. So that really needs to be sorted out quickly. I, I, I'll be fascinated to see particularly with Michael Edwards involved, how he interprets the data about where it's going with Van Dijk, where it's going with Salah. Um, Because, as we know, Van Dijk this season has been arguably Liverpool's best player. But he is of an age where it's difficult to sometimes gauge how long they have left. I know Virgil van Dijk feels that he can be like a Thiago Silva type player, you know, who can play until his late 30s. He hasn't been playing at the very top level for his whole career, he's actually, you know, quite late really. So he, he's still got that enthusiasm. He still feels like his body is is capable of doing it. I think it'd be an, a huge call to let him go. I mean, he's become crucial to Liverpool this season. He's been, as I say, the most important player. Salah is another one where, very interesting, where Liverpool could potentially cash in this summer in a sort of deal that would allow Edwards the flexibility to operate as he did when they sold Coutinho. I think the the the, the Salah is, is certainly the one where Liverpool could could make space for themselves if if they wanted to. But the, the squad's in a healthy shape as well. That's that's why you know whoever takes this job as manager is inheriting, I would say, a, a, a strong squad as strong as any squad that any manager is inherited since the nineteen seventies. You know, since Bill Shankly left the club with a a group of young younger players, I, I would say. It's not too extreme to say that, you know. I think that, you know, they they, they they did well, not necessarily by design last summer, but everything has sort of clicked into gear, and they've got a lot of young players who are showing a lot of promise as well. So, but the young players need those senior figures, you know, and Trent has become one of those senior figures as well. So it's it, it's going to be really interesting to see how quickly they can make decisions about that. All right, let's end it there, gents. Thanks so much for your time, Simon, Ollie, and do not forget to rate and review the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow for more. Thanks for listening.